Hi there. So welcome to module 13, IFRS 15, Revenue from Contract with Customers. Now this is one of the accounting standards that is replacing a number of standards or it's one of the new accounting standards that has come into effect just this year, that is January 2018. And so let's look at how the standard now. This standard is basically about how we can recognize revenue as a company. So how do we recognize revenue in our books? How do we recognize revenue from other sources, revenue from contracts, revenue from sales? How do we really recognize revenue in the books of accounts? So at the end of this module, you should be able to define and explain the concepts relating to the standards. You should be able to follow the five steps approach in solving questions about recognition of revenue in the financial statement. Then you should be able to define or determine the disclosure requirement about the standard IFRS 15. Now, what is the objective of IFRS 15? The objective of the standard is to establish the principle that an entity shall apply to report useful information to users of financial statements about the nature, amount, timing, and uncertainty of revenue and cash flows arising from a contract with customers. So that is the objective of this uh, accounting standard. Application of the standard is mandatory for annual reporting periods starting from 1st January 2018 onwards. So it became effective that uh, organizations must apply it as of 1st January 2018. So about, uh, that will be about four months ago, became effective in that order. Now this accounting standard replaces or supersedes the following standards. IAS 11, construction contract. IAS 18, revenue. IFRS, IFRIC 13, customer loyalty programs. IFRS IC, IFRIC 15, agreement from the construction of real estate. IFRS IC 18, transfer of assets from customers. And so these accounting standards have been superseded or replaced with the IFRS 15. The next question we ask ourselves is what is the scope of the standard? What is the scope of the standard? Now IFRS 15, the revenue from contract with customers applies to all contracts with customers except for leases within the scope of IAS 17, financial instruments and under other constructual uh, asset that is IFRS 9, consolidated financial statement that is IFRS 10, joint arrangement that is IFRS 11, separate financial statement that is IAS 27, and IAS 28, investment in associate and joint venture. Now, so when we talk about the scope of um, IFRS 15, it applies to all contracts with the exception of these contracts that we have mentioned so revenue that you earn on lease cannot be accounted for using this principle revenue that is earned on financial instruments cannot be accounted for using this accounting standard revenue earned from joint venture or consolidated or in the preparation of consolidated financial statement cannot be accounted for using this accounting standard the next thing we want to look at is the a statement about the standard. So a contract with a customer may be partially within the scope of IFRS 15 and partially within the scope of another standard. In that scenario, so sometimes we may have a contract with a, a customer or there may be a transaction and it is partly uh, in, within the scope of IFRS 15 and also within the scope of other standards. In that case, what do we do? One, if other standards specify how to how to separately and or measure one or more part of the contract, then those separations and measurement requirements are applied first. The transaction price is then reduced by the amounts that are initially measured under other standards. So that is what you have to understand in that case. Then the next one is that if other standard provides guidelines on how to separate and or initially measure one or more part of the contract, then IFRS 15 will be applied. So these are what you have to understand when it comes to the scope of IFRS 15. Now to talk about revenue from uh, customers or recognition of revenue from contracts with customers, 
we have to look at some key definitions. What are these key definitions? About six of them are very important. The first thing is to define what a contract is. Now, I believe that you know basically what a contract is, that a contract is an agreement, right? So what really is a contract? A contract is an agreement between two or more parties that creates enforceable rights and obligation. So that is a contract. A contract is an agreement between two parties, and that contract gives rise to a right and obligation within what the parties. In other words, one person is responsible to do something for the other party, and the other party is obliged to uh, pay for the money or pay for the service that is being rendered. The next thing we have to identify is a customer. Who is a customer? Customer can be defined as a party that has a contract that has contracted with an entity to obtain goods or services that are an output of the entity's ordinary activities in exchange for a consideration. So when we talk about a customer, we are talking about an individual or a party that has contracted the entity to procure or buy the output of the entity in return to pay for the consideration. In other words, to pay for the price of the product or the commodity or the service, depending on what you want to say. The next thing is to talk about income. I believe we've already defined income, but it is still in this standard and we still have to just state it again. An income is the increase in the economic benefit during the accounting period in the form of inflows or enhancements of the asset or decrease in liability that results in an increase in the equity. So that is what income is. And then what, there are two major things that we have to also identify. That is performance obligation. A promise in a contract with a customer to transfer to the customer either. So a performance obligation is a promise in a contract to transfer to the customer either a good or services or bundle of goods and services that is distinct or a series of distinct goods or services that are substantial that are substantially the same and that have the same pattern of transfer to the customer. So when we say performance obligation, we are referring to what the entity is going to do to the customer who has now contracted the entity in order to undertake a service or a project. So for instance, if you decide to take my online course, I now have a performance obligation. What is my performance obligation? My performance obligation is to provide you with the lecture videos, to provide you with the study materials, and to provide you with the assistance throughout the four months period so that you can prepare and write your exam. That is my performance obligation. Then the next thing we want to identify is transaction price. What is the transaction price? The transaction price is simply the amount of consideration to which an entity expects to be entitled in exchange for transferring promise, promised goods or services to a customer excluding amounts collected on behalf of third parties. So the transaction price is actually how much you are you are going to pay me for my course. So my performance obligation is what I'm going to do under our agreement. But transaction price is how much I'm charging you, how much you are going to want to pay me. So for instance, if you are paying 250 cities per course for maybe level one and you are paying 250 cities or you are paying 300 cities per course in level two or you are paying 450 cities per course in level three, what the, how much money you are paying to me is what refers to as the transaction price. So these are the key definitions that we must understand when it comes to IFRS 15, revenue, with, uh, revenue from contract with customers. Now, in order to account for the revenue in relation to what we are talking about, the accounting requirement of revenue based on IFRS 15 follows what we call the five-step model or framework. In other words, if we want to account for revenue under IFRS 15, there are five steps that we have to follow. There are five steps that we have to follow. Now, these five steps will help us to accurately recognize the revenues in the, the revenue in the books of accounts of the company. Now, what are these five steps? One, identify the contract with the customer. So that is the first thing we have to do. What is really the contract? What's really is the contract about about so a contract with a customer will be within the scope of IFRS 15 if all the conditions below are met one 
the contract has been approved by the parties to the contract so the customer has approved it the entity has approved it that is one of the conditions too each party's right in relation to the goods or services to be transferred can be identified. So you have a right to get a steady materials. I have a right to receive the money from you has been identified. Three, the payment terms for the goods and services to be transferred can be identified. So the payment terms as to your making payment in installments or making one-time payments has been identified. The next thing is that the contract has commercial substance. In other words, what we have agreed on is having some monetary value. Okay, having some monetary value, we can account for it according to IFRS 15. And then it is probable that the consideration to which the entity is entitled to in exchange for the goods or services will be collected. So all these conditions must be met before we can recognize a contract with an individual and account for it under IFRS 15. The first thing we said is that the contract must be approved by both parties to the contract. The rights must be identified by both parties to the contract. Payment stamps must be laid down and identified by both parties to the contract. The contract must have some commercial substance and then we, we as an entity must make sure that we will collect that money from the customers. So all these conditions must be met. Once all these conditions are met, then we can identify the contract. That is the first step, identification of the contract under IFRS 15. Immediately we identify the contract, the next thing we do is to identify the performance obligations in the contract. If you remember a moment ago, I defined performance obligation as what the entity promises to do under the contract in return for the consideration. So if, for instance, you, we are in contract, you are buying my online courses, so you are paying me money and I'm providing you with a tuition. And once I have identified a contract, I have to now identify the performance obligation. In other words, what are the various activities that I'm going to undertake during the contract? One, I am going to provide you with lecture videos. Two, I'm supposed to provide you with study materials. Three, I am supposed to provide you with a mock exams. And four, I am supposed to provide or be on the journey with you at least once in a week, have a live section with you. This is what we refer to as performance obligation under such contracts. So let's look at what the standard says. At the inception of the contract, the entity should assess the goods and services that have to be that have been promised to the customer and identify the performance obligation. So a good or service that is this. So what are we going to do under this agreement? Just like what I have stated to you. That is the second step. So the first step is we identify the contract to see if it meets the requirement of IFRS 15. Then we account for it. The second two thing is to identify the performance obligation. That is the various activities that the organization has to undertake in relation to the contract that has been signed with the customer. Third is to determine the transaction price, to determine the transaction price. The transaction price, we have identified it as the price or the amount to which the entity expects to be entitled in exchange for the transfer of goods and services. Now, when making this determination, the entity will consider past customary business practices. So once we identify the contract, once we have identified the performance obligation, the next question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the transaction price? How much is the customer going to pay for the contract under consideration? So if the customer is going to pay 450 cities for the cost, then that becomes the transaction price. The fourth thing is allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation in the contract. This is a key aspect of the whole thing. How, now that we know the various activities we undertake, the fourth step is to find out how to allocate the transaction price to the various performance obligations. So for instance, with the example that I'm, I gave you, let's say you're paying 450 cities per course on our online portal, and I'm supposed to provide you with lecture videos, study materials, mock exams, and uh, a one, at least once in a week live session. Now, if I'm taking that 450 cities from you, I have to allocate the 450 cities to each of their performance obligation. That is the fourth step. That is the fourth step so that we will know what we have done so far, what is left to be done. Then we will know which revenue we can 
recognized for the current year and which revenue we can defend for future activities because not all the performance obligation may have been undertaken as at the end of the financial or as at the end of the reporting period. Now, in doing that, IFRS suggests various methods that can be used. The first one is the adjusted market assessment approach, the expected cost plus um, market uh, approach, or the residual approach. So these are various approaches that we will be using in relation to allocating of the transaction price to performance obligation. Then the fifth step, the final step, is to recognize revenue when or as the entity satisfy a performance obligation. So, you see, when you say you have made a sales, but the sales you have made, there are various activities under the sales you have to undertake in. If you have not finished undertaking the activities, then you cannot recognize that revenue in the current year financial statement. And that is the purpose of IFRS 15. So once we have been able to look at the performance obligation, we know the transaction prices, we have allocated the transaction price to the various performance um, obligation, then what we have to do is to recognize the revenue as and when and the entity satisfy the performance obligation. So one, if you are paying for this series for my online course, and then the performance obligations are that you're going to have lecture videos, you're going to have study materials, you're going to have mock exams, and then you're going to have, let's say, um, my live session, my live question and answer session. So these are the four performance obligations under the agreement. So if I'm charging you 400 series per course, then I have to appropriate it or allocate it to each of the service that I'm going to render. So I can say, let a video take 150 cities. Let a study materials, the cost of the study material be 100 cities. Let the mock exam be 50 cities. And then let a live session cost you 100 cities. So that is going to total up to give me the 400 cities. Now, the fifth step about the recognition of the revenue is that once I provide you with all the lecture videos, I can recognize this as a revenue for the year. Now, even though you've paid the entire 400 cities, I cannot recognize the entire 400 cities as revenue. No. But I'm going to recognize it once I give you the lecture videos with the study materials. I'm going to recognize that 250 cities as revenue that has been earned by Premium Education Hub. Then the mock exam is going to be later, so it means that I recognize only 250. The 150 will also the live session will be going. So as and when I satisfy each of the obligations under the contract, then I recognize the revenue. That is what we mean by revenue uh, recognition. Now IFRS give guidelines that we can use to uh, recognize the revenues in the financial statement. One using the assets to purchase goods and services, using the assets to enhance the value of the other contracts or other assets, using the asset to settle liability or to reduce expenses, selling or the exchange of the asset, and then pledging the asset to secure a loan or holding the asset. So these are what you have to understand when we come to recognition of revenue. So the first thing is to identify the contract. The second thing is to identify the performance obligation. The third thing is to determine the transaction price. The fourth thing is to allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation. And the fifth thing is to recognize the revenue as and when the entity satisfy the performance obligation. These five things are the nuggets underlining how revenue will be recognized in IFRS 15. So there are two questions that we'll be going through in order to understand IFRS 15 and how to recognize revenue. So let's look at the first question. Aaron enters into a 12-month telecom plan with a local mobile operator, Tele PLC. The terms of the plan of the plan are as follow, follows. Aaron monthly fixed fee is $100. Aaron receives a free handset at the inception of the plan. Tele PLC sells the same handset for $300 and the same monthly re prepayment plans without handset for $80 per month. Required. How should Tele PLC recognize the revenue from this plan in line with IFRS 18 
and IFRS 15. So if you look at the question, well, we, we are told that there is a telecommunication company called TelePLC, and the customer here is Aaron. And Aaron has what we call a 12-month plan with the telecommunication company. And the conditions of the plan is that he is supposed to pay $100 every month for the 12 months, and then he will receive a free handset. But we are told that, assuming the telecommunication company is not giving or undertaking this plan, this, this 12 month plan with Aaron, the handset could have been sold for $300. And then when you buy the handset $300, you make a monthly payment of $80 in the period. So what it means is that this plan gives you $100 every month free handset, but the other plan will give you $80 every month, but you buy the handset at $300. So the question we ask ourselves is, how do we identify the revenue? How do we identify the revenue? Now, under IAS or yes, under IAS 18, revenue recognition is simple. So under IAS 18, the usual free handset would have been treated as a marketing cost. As such, we only recognize the revenue for each month as and when it is received. So, if we were in IAS 18 and IFRS 15 is replacing IAS 18, so if we're in IAS 18, all we do is that uh, the, the handset cost, which is $300, will be treated as marketing expenses or advertising expenses or cost of bringing in a, a customer. Then, as and when the monthly fee is uh, received, we will debit our cash book with $100 and then we credit the revenue account with $100 every month as and when it is received. So under IAS 18, there is no issue. It is very simple to go in that case. But according to IFRS 15, we must follow the five steps. We must follow the five steps. So in accordance with IFRS 15, we follow the five steps as follows. And the first thing we do is that under that, we need to identify the contract. So what is the contract that we are supposed to identify here? The identification of the contract will relate to Aaron. So under the contract, Aaron is going to receive a free handset. Okay? And he is going to make a monthly payment. Okay? Monthly payment of $800 per month. So the contract identification is this free handset and then monthly payments that is from the perspective of the customer then the second thing is to identify the performance obligation so the first step we identify the contract the second step we identify the performance obligation now the identification so step one identify the contract step two identification of performance obligation. The performance obligation, as you know already, is from the perspective of the company. So what is the company supposed to do under this agreement? The company is supposed to do to provide, so that will be from the tele PLC, and so the company is supposed to provide or deliver a free handset, so delivery of handsets to Aaron, that is the first thing that a company has to do. And the second thing is to provide network services. So identification of the contract, what a contract is about. Free handset, monthly payment of $100 per month. The performance obligation is what TelePLC has to do. You will have to deliver a free handset and then for the next 12 months, provide network services to Error. Then the third thing we need to look at is to consider the transaction price. Now, what is the transaction price in this case? You will note that, so step three, transaction price. Now, the price of this transaction will come from what we have here. There is a handset that is going to be delivered but the handset is free, so that's going to be zero dollars. But there is going to be a monthly payment. So it is more or less like a subscription. 
And that is going to be $100 per month times 12 months. And that will lead us to $1,200. So the transaction price in this case is $1,200. That is $100 every month times 12 months. So that is the, the third step. So first step, recognize the contract. There's a free handset monthly payment for 12 months. Step two, we identify the performance obligation that TelePLC must undertake. That is the delivery of handsets and provision of network services. Step three, that is the determination of the transaction price. The transaction price is going to entail the handset, which is zero because we are giving it out free, and then the monthly subscription or payment, which is $100 per month times 12. That is going to be 1200 once we have identified a contract, we have identified the performance obligation, we have also uh, determined the transaction price. The next thing we do is to allocate the transaction price over the performance obligation. Allocate the transaction price over the performance obligation. So to do that, to do that, I'm going to put a shadow down, all right? I'm going to put a shadow down to be able to do that. So let me pull up a shadow on that. So let me say one, two, let me say three, four, and then five. Okay, so let me put what we call the standalone price here. I'm not going to put anything here, but I'm just going to put proportion here. Then I'm going to put allocation here. Then I'm going to put actual allocation. Actual allocation. Now, why did I put up this shadow? Because we're going to account for the transaction or allocate the transaction price using a couple of methods. So we allocate a transaction price based on the proportion of the total standalone prices of each performance obligation. Now there are two performance obligations. Two performance obligations. What are the two performance obligations? If you remember from the second step, we said a handset. Right? And then if you remember, we also said that the monthly fees. That's the contract, okay? monthly fees or subscription. So we're going to provide network services for them and then in, 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 in return, the customer has to pay the money. Now, what is the standalone price? So the principle here, please understand, if we are allocating the transaction price over the performance obligation, we use the standalone price proportionate to the allocation. And you will understand that the transaction price is $12,000. Or $1,200. $1,200. So we're going to allocate this $1,200 based on the standalone prices of the contracts of the contract. So we were told in the question that assuming it is not this plan, assuming the package is not like that, the handset costs $300. Then if it is not that this contract, then everybody would have paid $80 per month. So that is $80 per month times 12 months. So 80 by 12, that will give me 960. So these are the standalone prices of the contract that we identified. Then we add the two. When we add the two, we will get 1260. This is the total standalone prices. So it is this total standalone prices that we are going to use to apportion the actual transaction price. So if you look at this, here it's where we're going to do the proportion. So it's going to be 300 over the total. 1260 times 100. And this will be 960 over 1260 also times 100. When we do this, the proportion is going to be 23.8%. When we do this, the proportion is going to be 76.2%. So this is the proportion. Remember what I said. We allocate the transaction price 
based on the proportion of the total standalone prices of each performance obligation. So these are the standalone prices. This is the proportion. So now, to allocate the actual transaction price, it is going to be what we allocate for the handset is going to be 23.8% of the figure and then 76.2% of the figure. So when we do that, the actual amount to be allocated for the handset is going to be 286. Then the actual amount to be allocated here is going to be 914. And so we get a total of 1,000. 200. So that is what you have to understand when it comes to the allocation of the transaction price over the performance obligation. So you consider the standalone prices, that is, what each of the transactions in the question would have been if the contract or they were not sold together. Then you find a proportion, then you multiply that with the transaction price, and that will give you the actual allocation. It means that um, under IAS 18, we write off the handset as an expenses, but under IFRS 15, the handset is not a cost. It, we need to still sell it. It means this time around, we are going to get a revenue of 286 on the handset. So instead of selling it at uh, $300, we are now going to sell it at $218. Then instead of getting a monthly subscription fee of $960, when everybody is paying it solely, we are going to get $914. It is a package to do in order to motivate employees or in order to motivate people to subscribe for our services. So in a nutshell, you realize that the standalone price is uh, $1,260, but we will get $12,200. So in that case, the company is quote unquote losing $60, but it's a promotional package that a company undertakes. So once we have been able to allocate the revenue as the one relating to the handset, 286, we now recognize it. We now recognize it. So the final step is to recognize the revenue. Now, so the fifth step, recognition of revenue. In the recognition of revenue, you see, revenue has two ways of being recognized or can be recognized in two ways. We recognize revenue at, that is when the transaction takes place, and we recognize revenue over, that is over the remaining life of the contract. So when it comes to the step five, immediately the handset is delivered. Immediately the handset is delivered to Aaron, we need to recognize the revenue on the handset. How do we recognize that? We're going to debit the contract asset with the figure we got 286 and we credit our revenue 286. We treat that because we have sold the assets. We have sold the asset, we are getting revenue, then we debit what? The contract asset account. Now, why do you think we are debiting the contract asset account? We are debiting the contract asset account because uh, the, the thing is the whole package is 1200 so it's like a debtor. So we need to debit his account in order to find out that this is how much we have debited in relation to the handset that has been delivered. Then the second thing is that the service cost, which is the 914, will be recognized over the contract period. So to do that, we are going to divide 914 by 12 so that every month we will get a chargeable monthly income. So what is this is what is going to happen in the recognition of that. So two. So this is recognized at then the monthly subscription fee will be recognized over. So for every month, Aaron is supposed to pay us $100. Supposed to pay us $100. So when Aaron pays the $100, what are we going to do or how are we going to account for it in our books? So what we do is debit our cash book because we're going to receive 
hundred dollars. We debit our cash bill because we receive hundred dollars. Then we're going to credit the contract account or what we call the receivables with the hundred dollars. With the hundred dollars, that is the contract price with the hundred dollars. But we need to find out how much that we can transfer every month into what the account. Now, for this handset, the handset relates to the services. It means that this handset revenue has to also be divided by 12. So in as much as we are dividing the, the 914 by 12 to recognize the revenue every month, we have to also divide the handset by 12 to recognize the revenue for that. So how do we now do it? So if, when we receive the cash, we debit the cash book and we credit the receivables. Then we look at the appropriation. When we divide 914 by 12, we are going to get 76 every month. And when we divide 86, 286 by 12, we are going to get $12 every month. So how do we allocate it? And you remember, you see that when we add this to this, we are going to get what? The 100. So how do we account for it? To account for it, we now debit the receivables with the hundred, so we're going to transfer it out. Then we're going to credit two things. We're going to credit the contract asset account. With every month, $12, and then we credit revenue. Every month with a figure of 76. So this is how we recognize the revenue in the financial statement. This is how we recognize the revenue in the financial statement. Now, you have to be able to understand the recognition criteria in this case. So, every month we receive the money, we credit the receivables account. Every month, for that hundred we receive, we have to separate it into two. What relates to the transaction, what relates to the service we are rendering, and what relates to the handset. So that's why we have to create a contract asset so that at the end of the 12 months, this contract asset is going to be zero. That is why we need to now debit the receivables account and then what? We transfer it to the contract asset and then the revenue account. So that is what you have to understand in relation to that question. So finally, let's look at question two. It's about furniture. And let's look at how we can also recognize revenue over and recognize revenue at. So a furniture company sells furniture at $1,000 on two-year interest-free credit. On the first day of the current year, the, the table is delivered two weeks after the contract is signed. So a customer bought a table and we delivered it two weeks after the contract is, was signed. Then the liability is paid off by two installments, 500 each at the end of year one and year two. Interest on other similar deals is 16%. Further investigation reveals that similar deals were common last year. Last year, revenue was simply recognized as at stated sales price and other financial implications were ignored. Discuss the implication of the above transaction on the current financial statement. So what you are seeing here is that the company is selling furniture, selling an asset. However, when they make the sales, they, the payment is made in two installments, at the end of year one, at the end of year two. But what the accountant is doing in this question is that the accountant has been recognizing the revenue at. So immediately the sales takes place, he recognizes the whole revenue. So even though the money is going to be received in two installments, the accountant recognizes the revenue. What it means is that revenue that have been reported in previous accounting year or last uh, in the last accounting year may have contained revenue that shouldn't have been recognized in the last year financial statement. So what we have to do is to follow a step or principle in relation to how we solve the question. Now, the sales is $1,000. That is $1,000. 
Now, so we have to first calculate the fair value of the furniture. Now, you see, there is nothing like interest-free credit. So if a company makes an advert that, oh, you can buy our product for $100,000 and it is interest-free credit, and so you can buy it, we won't charge you any interest, and you go away. No, it is, there is nothing like that in the world. So in that $1,000, there is what we call a, an interest or a finance cost. So the first thing you have to do is to find the fair value of the furniture or the fair value of the transaction. So for instance, a company comes and says, you buy TV and you can pay it or television and you can pay it in 12 months installment. Then they say it is interest free. But if you go to other shops where you are paying ready cash, that same TV, that same brand is costing a price less than what the company is charging. What it means is that the difference is the finance cost. So we must calculate the fair value of the furniture. Now, to calculate the fair value of the furniture, we use what we call the discounting cash flow techniques. So let's look at what is happening here. So we're going to put year on one side, then we put cash flow on the other side, then we put discounting factor. Remember, we were told that other transactions are financed at 16% interest, and then we're going to put the present value on that side. Now, the payment is made in two equal installments, year one and year two, and the cash flows are 500, 500. The discounted factor for 16%, when you read it on the discounting factor table, it's 0 0.862 or 0 0.743. Now, if you want to calculate this, it is simply 1 over 1 plus R exponent N. In other words, to get this rate, it is going to be 1 over 1 plus 0 0.16 exponent 1. Then you'll be able to get this rate be able to get this rate. Now, so if we discount this, the present value is going to be, in dollars, is going to be 431 for this, and then 372 for that. So when we calculate or add these two, we are going to get 803. This 803 is the fair value of the furniture. In other words, this is how much the furniture sells. But they are selling it $1,000 because the difference is the interest. The difference is the interest. So how do we go about recognizing the revenue at and over? Now, there are two components that must be split out in relation to the recognition of the revenue as I mentioned. Now, so if you realize it, So the two components. So in the recognition of the revenue, we must do two things. From what we did here, the fair value of the furniture is 803, but the company is charging a total of 1,000. It means the balancing figure in this case will be finance cost or finance. Or interest and that will be 197 so this is the two components of the total amount thousand dollars so fair value 803 and then the balancing figure is the finance interest in that so that is the two or these are the two revenue in the thing so if you make the sales and you recognize the whole thousand as year one that is not actually how it has to be recognized. Rather, we must separate it into the finance component and then into the fair value component. Once the asset is delivered, once the asset is delivered, we transfer or recognize this 808 at. But this finance cost will be paid over the two years. So this 197 will be recognized over the period of two years. So you must understand it. Once we deliver the assets, once we deliver the furniture, we recognize 803 as revenue for the current year. But the finance cost, $197, must be recognized over the contract period, which is, in this case, two years. 
So what must we do in the recognition of the transaction? So the finance is over two years. As such, we have to unwind the revenue using the cost amortization technique. Remember, payment is made at the end of the year. Payment is made at the end of the year. So let's see the unwinding as to how we recognize the revenue in the books of accounts of the company. So still payment is made at the end of the year. So it is more or less like you are doing having a lease. So it is more or less like you are doing a lease. So if payment is made at the end of the year, you are going to bring your balance brought forward. Then you bring your interest, right? Then you bring your installments. Then you bring your balance carry forward. Now it's two periods, okay? So one, the first one is you are owing 803. We are discounting the fair value of the furniture. So 803, 16% of 803, that will give us 128. Then we will pay an installment or the customer is paying installment of 500. And that is leading us to what we call 431. That 431 will become the opening balance in year two. And we charge 16% of that, and that is 69. And still, installment is 500. This plus this will put us to dash. Now, why do we do this? We do this so that we can determine the interest in year one and the interest in year two that has to be recognized. So after we do this, you know that these two interest is what give us or what will give us the 197. So what is the current income statement? So in a current income statement, revenue to be recognized will include what and what? Revenue to be recognized will include the furniture which we delivered. So 803. Then the finance, which we did the workings for the first year, the first year, 128. So the total revenue to be recognized for the first year is 931. 931. So that is what you do in the current income statement. Now, on the balance sheet, the company would have a receivables of 431. So if you look at a balance sheet, this is the closing balance as at the end of the year. So this is how much that is outstanding that we are going to be receiving. So this will be recorded under current assets receivables 431. Note, there were similar transactions last year and other financial implications were ignored. It means instead of recording revenue at 931, Instead of recording revenue as 931, 1,000 was recorded. The difference of 69 is a material error, error since there were common transactions. For this reason, we do a prior period adjustment. So because we were told that last year similar transactions take, took place and the accountant didn't take the accounting effect of the transactions, so instead of recognizing the revenue as 931, the transactions were recognized as 1,000. So the difference of 69, we will undertake a prior period adjustment to the revenue of the last year period so that we bring it in line with the other transactions that must be made in the current year financial statement. So these are the two questions you need to understand. Remember the first question, what we did is to recognize a transaction in Aaron and that was for issues about free handsets and then a services. Then we recognize the performance obligation where we said that it is in relation to uh, delivering a free handset and then receiving a monthly fee of $100. And from there, we determine the contract price. Determination of the contract price, what we said was that the handset is free, so that is zero, but for every month, the company will receive $100 for 12 months, and that is $1,200. From there, we came to the allocation of the transaction price 
with or to the performance obligation. And there we use the stand alone or we allocate the transaction price to the performance obligation using the proportion of the stand alone prices. So we use the stand alone price of the handset which was $300 and then the stand alone price for the subscription which was 80 by 12 and that was 960 and that led us to having 1260. Then we apportioned that with the transaction price where we had 300 over 1260 times the 1200 for the handset and we got our figure there and we saw how we recognize it in the books of accounts. Then in this second question, the company has sold an asset, has sold a furniture, but they said it is interest free. But it's a lie because there is nothing like interest free. So we need to first find the fair value. Fair value is discounting the installments that are going to be paid to present value using the interest rate implicit on the contract. In this case, it was 16%. Once we do that, we'll be able to distinguish between the revenue that relates to the furniture and then the finance interest that was in. And we saw that the revenue for the furniture was 803 and then the total finance cost was 97. However, we need to now find out what finance cost has to be charged for the current year of the 197 and the one that has to be charged for the next year. So we do the unwinding technique by bringing the uh, value for the furniture which is the 803 applying the interest rate and since payment is made at the end of the year we bring interest rate before installment and we did that so this 10128 will be recognized as the finance revenue and then the whole revenue of 803 which is recognized at the time that we deliver the asset will be also recognized in the financial statement so the total revenue in the first year of operation is 931 but how much is outstanding is 431 that will be treated under trade receivables in the current asset in the statement of financial position. Finally, to conclude on IFRS 15, we must look at the disclosure requirements. The disclosure objective stated in IFRS 15 is for an entity to disclose sufficient information to enable users understand the financial statements, the nature, the amount, the timing, and all these. But apart from these, the standard also requires that our entities provide information about the contract with customers, the significant judgments that were made, and then any assets recognized from the cost to obtain or to fulfill the contract. So entities must disclose these in the financial statement, and that is what you have to understand when we talk about IFRS 15, revenue, with contracts from customers. Revenue from, let me take that name again. Revenue from contracts with customers. So that is what you have to understand.